Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56, please. I'm an agriculturalist, and uh, I didn't really believe much of what was said about industrial farming, uh, about it being terribly inefficient and ruining the soil. And uh, I think the, the farmers aren't silly or stupid, especially the ones that own the, own the land, that they take good care of it. And uh, there have been some, some problems, some things that, have, that are noticeable. If when I was a kid, if we went to Minnesota, you wouldn't see much irrigation. There was a lot of organic matter in the soils. And uh, now the farmers have irrigation. They, they need to put, put water in there. And that's, that's part uh, of just, it's part of taking the crops off. I, I suppose that's, that's a, a big part of it. But they realize they have the problem and they, and they work, work at it, trying to get organic matter back in the soil. Uh, I have a sort of a different different perspective on some of this that uh, I don't think there's going to be a big impasse sometime in the future uh, by itself. But uh, I, I recognize the historical fact there was a, there was a year without a summer, 1816. There was a, a volcano that, that erupted in the South Pacific, in Indonesia, and. Uh, there was a freeze, a hard freeze, every month in the in the northern hemisphere, the the places we know of, uh, eastern North America, Western Europe. There was famine all over India and China. It's in a historical record, and and that scares me a whole lot more. Uh, another event happening like that than the than uh, us wearing out the soil at any time soon, or uh, it's one thing I really don't under, understand. I keep hearing how terrible Brazil is, but I don't understand that or where people. Are, uh, are coming from with destroying the rainforest. These people are very good agriculturists. They, they know what they're doing. They're, they're uh, uh, planting crops and, and uh, they're returning the fertilizers and things to the soil as well as anybody has. And can I just ask you one last little quick thing? You mentioned earlier in, in the discussion about the small plot of sure. land uh, in terms so because when I mean, one of the most hopeful things to me right is this idea that in not just in Detroit but in Normandy and everywhere that they could take this small area and have you know three four or five different things growing so closely together so this is impressive from an agricultural um, oh I, that was ecological perspective imp like wonderfully you. impressive if, if it could really be done there they were talking about a, a, what less than a football field a half a football field or something uh, in, in size and making 30 or 40 some thousand dollars a year off of it. If that could be done, people would do it. And, but I think most of the things they were talking about are wonderful. Uh, the, the things that they are doing, sure. Yeah. Terrific. We'll come back to a lot of these topics. Uh, Nick Heinen, do you want to just say a little again what your specialty is and what yeah, reactions thanks. have had? Uh, I, I guess I think about Marxist urban theory. Uh, and, and spend a fair bit of time thinking about anti-capitalist politics, uh, anti-racist politics, and, and feminist politics, kind of how they all come together. And I think the, the interest uh, from this film, one of the words that was in here twice, but only twice, and I thought could have been in here more, but I appreciated the sentiment, was the notion of revolution. I think uh, we're at a time when there's uh, an opportunity and a need to think more creatively and more imaginatively about the notion of revolution. And I think this movie hints at that in, in very important ways. Uh, thinking about our, our French comrades who, uh, who helped bring us here tonight, uh, thinking about Paris, May 68, and the general strike there as a very interesting example, a historical moment to think through what climate change politics could look like uh, if there was more solidarity and more organizing and more coming together. There's this fantastic quote that I just kind of kept cycling through in my head as I was watching the, the, the preview of the film. Uh, a Marxist literary scholar named Frederick Jameson said, it's easier to imagine the end of the, the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Right? And, and so you, you, know, you think about that and you watch this and you're just like, shit. <laughs> and Patricia. Um, and now I'm supposed to follow on that. <laughs> Professor Yeager, and yeah, do you want to? Um, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Yeager. I'm a professor in marine sciences, and I'm a climate scientist. I study how the climate is affect changing, how the climate is changing and affecting the ocean. Um, and so I listened pretty carefully to the comments that were made in the movie about climate science, and I agreed with most of them and most of the critical ones, I think. And, and the really big one that I, I don't know how much you know about, most of you probably know about the melting sea ice, and you know about the melting glaciers and sea level rise. Um, but what he was saying about the hydrologic cycle is a really, really important piece of the puzzle that's just sort of developed in the last five to ten years. Scientists, mm -hmm. you know, I work a lot in Brazil, actually, at the Amazon River um, plume, mostly <laughs> offshore. And we've been arguing for 15 years about whether Brazil was going to get wetter or drier with climate change and whether the Amazon River was going to increase or decrease and how the rain was going to. Turns out we're both right. Everybody was right. It's getting, they've had the worst floods and the worst droughts that they've had in over 100 years in the last decade or so. So it's the extreme events that's really impacting, especially the water cycle. And if you talk to people like Pam Knox on our campus, who's an agricultural extension person by original or originally she's a climate scientist I don't know if she's maybe she's here but she she works a lot with the farmers in Georgia and trying to help them anticipate how climate change in Georgia is going to affect agriculture in Georgia and it all has to do with water temperatures bad but dryness is worse and too much water at the wrong time is also bad so the links to the hydrologic cycle are really important um, I guess I would just, the only other piece I would add was um, a lot of the talk about extinctions and, and, and ecosystem diversity. Um, there's a lot of debate about this sixth extinction argument. Um, not everybody agrees totally with it. Um, I think if you compare it to an asteroid, it's not that bad yet, thankfully. Um, it's, it's bad, but it's not as bad <laughs> as an asteroid. So we have to be a little bit careful with hyperbole when it comes to biodiversity. The issue in the ocean, which is the one I know best, is we don't even know what the diversity of the ocean is because we haven't explored it. Most of the ocean has gone completely unexplored. And if you know me, you know that I was involved in the discovery of an ecosystem we didn't even know about in the past few years, uh, an Amazon River reef, <laughs> a reef off the coast of the Amazon River, which was really exciting to find, and we didn't even know it was there. So the ocean serves as this very big unknown, and, and we're, what we do know is that the fisheries, which we tend to follow very well, um, we've overfished most of the fish in the ocean, and I think the number 75% of the fisheries are no longer sustainable and no longer um, going to going to survive, and that's huge. So maybe we don't know all the diversity in the ocean, but the diversity we do care about, like fish, we are, we are really doing some damage to. So I'm on board with the sustainability arguments, even though it maybe isn't as bad as we thought. <laughs> and could we take advantage of you being here? Do you want to say anything about Antarctica in its current? I know it's not in the movie. One of the things the movie does skip over is the oceans. And I, I mean, in some ways, I think they might avoid some of the real typical things that people see of the of of you know ice melting and glaciers melting and things like that. So I don't know if it was deliberately left well, out or not. Well, so but do you say so I teach climate change, and I can vouch for the idea that it's bad and sea level rise is happening, and it's happening probably faster than we thought, um, and the loss of the sea ice, which doesn't affect sea level, but turns out the loss of the sea ice, which is an ecosystem in itself, I should say, it's not just ice cubes floating around, it's full of life, and that life is going extinct. Um, but there's now all these links to our weather. So, there's so, so I could go on and on and on for weeks about how bad climate change is, and I'm happy to talk to any of you. I guess I just, um, when I finish a class or I finish a lecture on climate change, I always want to say, but we can fix it. We actually really understand the problem. And we, I mean, this last two hours was amazing. We know what the solutions are. We don't have to invent anything new. We just have to get organized. And I think we have been, I've been barking up the wrong tree for 20 years that we, we fix it at the national level. And that isn't going to happen for the reasons that were pretty nicely laid out here. We have to fix it locally. And I grew up in Seattle, so I have sort of an optimistic idea about how you can fix things locally. <laughs> um, but I've been living in Athens now for almost 20 years, and, and it seems like Athens is a place that could fix this locally as well. 
and really make a difference. And so I'm very encouraged by this movie. I don't know how you guys feel or how you guys feel, but it's a very optimistic movie. And so there are things we can do to fix it locally. And if everybody does that, then we've solved the problem. Right, and that it's a very human film, and, and certainly that notion that it, it wants to get away, as you say, from um, assuming, well, well, won't somebody take care of this for us? Uh, but so that whole notion by the end, certainly, of thinking about economics and thinking about uh, communities and how people on every level relate to each other differently. So it, it really wants to have this kind of holistic and, and optimistic sort of notion, but say, basically, you know, we're the ones living here, and our kids are the ones who are going who are gonna to be here after us, so you know, let's get going right yeah, now. So. I want to go home and show this film to my kids. That's nice. Um, so, should we open it up for any kind of questions? And, and at any point, um, yes. It's probably a waste of time and effort, but how do we get our president elect to watch oh, the film? Ah, uh, well, to, I don't know. If, does Trump watch any kind of movies, much less this? I have no idea. But you're right. I mean, and that's part of the. I think that's part of the hope of this of this movie is basically say, you know, who needs them. I mean, to a certain extent, everybody does, yes. But it also wants to show, I think, right, this idea of it's the, it's the little local community kind of stuff that, that that's actually going to make differences. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it, that, that's the big whatever you, you know, not, the whale in the room, not even an elephant in the room, is, yeah, how important this is right now. So I would say um, there are ways to make at least address the climate change issue that are economically beneficial, some of the arguments you heard tonight in the movie. Um, and he's a man about pocketbooks and budgets. And I, I think that if, if, they're, if he were willing to listen, which I'm not sure if he <laughs> is, but it wouldn't be that hard to make an economic argument for jobs, for saving money, for being energy uh, efficient. And I mean, there's a lot of really good arguments. And there are actually politicians um, I don't know if you saw Bob Inglis, he came through town last year and talked about, it's, a, it's an organization of Republicans called Republic N with an E-N on the end for energy and environment. And he lives in South Carolina and he has this whole group of people trying to organize to show that there are free market Reagan type solutions. You know, I know you're going to argue with this, but at least it's a way of getting some people that think this way on board about how do we solve the problem, admitting the problem first, but then showing that there are free market solutions to the problem that save people money and make jobs. So I don't think it's as dire financially as we might think. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you're right, you I guys disagree. <laughs> you disagree. All right, Other yeah. kinds of questions or comments on In it? In Georgia, yeah. if you can find free market solutions, that will get more people on board, I think, than, right. than others. No, yeah, in a second, yes, in the back. Yeah, it's a good point. The resilience, because I mean, there was that one family where they said, "Well, look, this was all just rocks and crummy soil, and after years of you know composting everything, we've we've brought this field back." And I think that's very similar to the Indian community, where, "Oh my gosh, we're going to build this one build, we're going to make a duplex, and we're going to have half untouchables and half not." So yeah, you're right. I think that whole notion that you take a problem and start to solve it, and it, and, and it has to do with local things like planting you know <laughs> corn out in front of the police station and a couple feet, uh, to then larger issues of, "No, we're going to go outside of town and plant stuff too." So that notion of of using things you've got and you can do any day right around you, but then expanding on it. You're right, your resilience is a good point. And, and nature is resilient too, and that's, nature is really resilient in many ways, not always, but in many ways it is, and one of the arguments against this sixth extinction thing is that we aren't accounting for the resiliency of a lot of the ecosystems when we do those calculations. Seem a little bit more optimistic 
But do you have a notion of kind of the time window and what we're really dealing with about the I'll just I'll say something quick. I mean, I th I think that you know Jim Hansen has been has been using twenty years for I don't know <laughs> uh, uh, forty years, right? So there's a elasticity to to the way we think about this, and I think the threshold really has to do with issues of vulnerability. I mean, people have been dying because of these climate changes for a while because of you know the 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 different storm systems that have 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 resulted, and it's folks that can can uh, you know again the resilience, uh, but can can incubate themselves because of the capital or the, the, the financial resources that they have uh, at their disposal. So, you know, I mean, the same with food production, right? I mean, we have more food on the planet that everyone can have 4,000 calories a day. Uh, and yet we have so many people, you know, uh, dying of, of, of starvation. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a logistics problem, as Amartya Sen was awarded a, a Nobel Prize in economics for trying to, to lay out I mean, there, there is, I think, a, a different dimension to it, but I think that the, the social construction of the problem is a very real part of the, of the, the time horizon also. Yeah, I, that, that's great. It depends what you're, what you're worried about, what timeline you're on. If you're asking me about the stability of the ice shelves mm -hmm. or sea level rise or more macro. macro. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not a, I don't, I'm, I wouldn't put myself anywhere near E.O. Wilson in terms of understanding global ecology. I'm, a, I'm an oceanographer, so I, I don't have, have an answer to your question. I do know, I mean, since I was a PhD student in the late 80s, early 90s, what we knew about climate change then, most of the predictions of what's going to happen and when are pretty close. We've, we've known about it for a long time. But what I see happening is that a few things that are kind of critical are coming a little faster than we thought they were going to hit. Um, and then there's the unexpected, which is the extreme event story, which I, didn't, I don't think anybody expected. Well, maybe somebody smart did, but most of us didn't. Um, and the, the sea level rise issue is huge because that has a very large global impact on most, most everyone because we all live pretty close to the coast. And you know, I'm on a project right now where we don't even really understand how fast and how much sea level is going to rise because we don't understand the ice sheets. And they're doing things we didn't understand or we don't understand. So we're all trying to focus on that right now to try to figure that out. But there's a lot of unknowns. And the scientists are working as fast as we can with the limited resources. But there's a lot of things we can't tell you about because we don't know. It's the surprises I'm worried about. And Hansen has made a pretty good case for the surprises, that there are things that we don't understand. We've crossed a few tipping points, and those are the ones you worry about. So I would say sooner the better. Um, in terms of 20 versus 25 versus 5, <laughs> I think 20 is not a bad target to try to fix this by 20, 20 years. It's probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I would think more in terms of the, you know, the, the, the one and a half to two degrees more than the time. I mean, right. 20 years is going to come faster if we spend a lot more carbon in the next five years than we were planning. So that 20 years gets shortened. It's more about the CO2 and the temperature changes than the actual year. And that's why the, the IPCC and places like that have switched from sort of the, the year framework to the what's the carbon doing framework. Yeah, that's helpful. And in fact, one of the things that early on that's really scary for a non-scientist is that notion when the guy says, well, you know, we're, we're all now going into a period where humans and everything we live with is going to be living in a, in a, in a, a temperature zone that nobody's ever, ever, no humans have ever lived in. I mean, so that notion that, yeah, it, it, I think that, that kind of thing is just kind of like mind-boggling.
Oh, well, that's a whole nother two weeks of lecture. I'd be happy. <laughs> no, no it, that's a huge problem. Um, the CO2 in the ocean is um, leading to a lot of animals not being able to, to live normally and function. So, and that's just going to get worse, too, as the CO2 goes up. So it's the, it's the other half of the fossil fuel problem. Well, it's directly coupled to the CO2 rise. Um, so it will happen again as fast as we put the CO2 up in there. Um, and that's pretty much on target. We are, we are I remember the, the curves that we had when in the 90s were sort of the, the rose-colored glasses scenario where we kind of went up and then back down. And then we had the, OK, well, this is probably most realistic. And then there was the, what was it called? The, um, the what? <laughs> the, the business as usual, where we didn't do anything, and we have exceeded the business as usual. Um, we haven't done anything. I mean, even all of the work that's being done around the world, but the U.S. is sitting here, and we're already ex above the business as usual scenarios, which we thought were ridiculous, because of course we were going to do something, right? But we haven't. So we're in, in worse case than we were in those projections. Any final? Yes. Yeah, Nick, you might, because that was the person who also said, and, and the woman sitting next to him says, oh, and you know, some people are going to have to start to move for food and water problems, and, and other people are happy where they are, and they don't necessarily want those people coming there to compete with them. So, yeah, do you want to? I mean, I, you know, Thomas Malthus of the 1800s talked about population growth as being a, a major problem for humanity, and, and many people have pushed back on that. Again, it comes back to a logistics question. There's, there's more than enough resources on the planet for everyone. It, it has to do with the distribution of those resources. I mean, the fact that we have such rampant, uneven development since the 70s, going like that, um, and, and the, the very richest getting more and more rich and the, the middle class shrinking. I mean, it's those kinds of issues that, you know, we have to get graphs and, and charts out to understand completely in relationship to population growth. But the short answer, in my opinion, is that I, I, you know, there's, population growth is not a problem um, in, any, in any significant way that we can't deal with given the, the, the technology and, and resources that we have.